Good morning, friends. Thank you, Ruby. God's Old Testament promises. The Bible is a very precious gift from God, telling us of historical events which occurred many years ago and showing us how to live acceptably before our Creator. Although it was written by many faithful men, its main purpose is to point the reader to a central figure in man's history. That figure, of course, is Jesus Christ, Saviour of the world. Beginning at Genesis and ending at Revelation, there are many scriptures which point to this one man who is the central point of man's history. So that this presentation is meant to show some of those scriptures from the Old Testament. The book of Genesis tells us that God created man and placed him in the Garden of Eden. God also took a rib from Adam's body and made a woman so that Adam could have a companion. The couple were told not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, otherwise they would surely die. But there was a serpent there who spoke to the woman and deceived her into partaking of the forbidden fruit. Adam also decided to eat the fruit, although Adam was not deceived. Immediately the couple realised that they were naked. When God found out what had happened, he banned Adam from the garden and put a curse on the serpent. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Gen Genesis 3.15 The New Testament helps us to identify who that serpent was. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus gives his disciples the authority to crush Satan and his forces. And in Revelation chapter 20, we read about Satan's demise during the age to come. Revelation 22 and 3. So the seed of the woman, that is, Jesus, was going to crush Satan's power over mankind, while his death meant salvation would be available to all. So we see the very first promise of God to our first parents in Eden. In the fourth chapter of Genesis, Cain and Abel were asked to bring an offering of worship to God. Cain's offering consisted of the fruit of the ground. Abel's offering was a young lamb or goat which he sacrificed on his altar. Genesis 4.4 4 tells us that the Lord looked with favour on Abel and his offering, but Cain and his offering were not looked upon with favour, and that made Cain very angry. In fact, Cain became so jealous that he murdered his brother. Abel's offering of a young lamb and its shed blood was the beginning of many sacrifices throughout the Old Testament which were always acceptable to God. When John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1.29 After Jesus' death, 
there was no longer a need to sacrifice in lambs anymore. In the chapter 7 of Acts, we're told about God telling Abraham to leave Ur in Mesopotamia and to go to a land which God would show him, the land of Canaan, a total distance of over 2,000 kilometres. In addition to this journey, God promised that from him there would come a great nation which would inherit the land. And through that nation would come the blessing of all the families of the earth. Genesis 12, 2 and 3. God appeared to Abraham again in Haran, and again in Shechem, again in Bethel, and twice in Hebron, repeating this same promise and confirming a covenant with him which we call the Abrahamic Covenant. God also asked Abraham to circumcise all the males in his household from then on throughout the generations. It was not until Christ's death that circumcision was no longer required. God also appeared to Isaac when Isaac was thinking about going to Egypt because of a great famine. He repeated the same promises to Isaac, telling him to stay where he was living and to trust in his promises. Genesis 26, 3 and 4. God also appeared to Jacob from the top of a stairway of angels which Jacob saw in a dream when he was at Bethel. God's message was a reminder to Jacob that through his seed all the families of the earth would be blessed and that God would watch Jacob and look after him wherever he went. Genesis 28, 13 to 15. Abraham had three visitors, probably angels, who came to tell him that Sarah would give birth to a son, even in her old age, for it was past ch childbearing age for her, and she had been childless. Sarah actually overheard the conversation, and she laughed at the statement. But those three men also came to tell Abraham that God had seen the wickedness in Sodom and had decided to destroy the city. Abraham queried God. He asked him if there were still ten righteous people there, would he still destroy the city? God said that if he found ten, then he would not destroy the city. Genesis 18, 32. God then went ahead and sent burning sulphur upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah. At that time there was a king and priest in Jerusalem. His name was Melchizedek. Abraham had gathered all his men to fight off King Kadur Loma, who had attacked Lot and his household and had stolen his possessions. It was an important victory for Abraham and he returned to pay tithes to Melchizedek, priest of the Most High God, Genesis 14, 18 to 20. Psalm 110 and also Hebrews chapter 7 tell us that Jesus has now become a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who was both king and priest. Hebrews 7, 16. Mm -hmm. 
In Genesis 22, we find Abraham's faith being put to the test. God asked him to take Isaac up to the top of Mount Moriah and sacrifice him there. In a fitting picture of God offering his beloved son as a sacrifice, Abraham drew his knife and was about to kill Isaac when the angel of the Lord told him to stop because the Lord had provided a ram in the nearby thicket which he could put on the altar instead of Isaac. Abraham's faith had passed the test and God told him that because he'd done this, his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand upon the seashore. Genesis 22, 15 to 17. In Genesis 49, we find the account where Jacob gathers his 12 sons to his bedside and they learn the outcome of their father's wise words. When he came to the prophecy of Judah, he indicates that a royal line would come through him. He says the scepter will not depart from Judah nor the rule of staff between his feet until he comes to whom it belongs and the obedience of the nations is his. Genesis 49.10 This tells us that a future king would rule the world and would come from the tribe of Judah. Jesus is that future king. He descended from the tribe of Judah. He will rule the world in righteousness in the time to come. The children of Israel lived in Egypt for 430 years. When they complained about their hard taskmasters, God sent Moses and Aaron to lead them away from the Egyptians into the wilderness. But they had to place lamb's blood on their lintels and doors in order to avoid the slaughter of their firstborn sons by the death angel as he passed over. God wanted them to always remember this event called the Passover as an institution throughout their history. Every year on the 14th of Nisan, they were to celebrate the victory over Egypt with bitter herbs, with unleavened bread and with roast lamb. The head of the family was to tell the whole story of their deliverance from slavery to his children and his grandchildren. The importance of this holy celebration continued with the nation of Israel for 1400 years until the death of Jesus, who is really the true Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world, as told by John the Baptist, John 1, 29. Actually, Jesus was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, Revelation 13, verse 8. In other words, God in his foreknowledge had provided redemption for a sin-cursed world even before Adam and Eve were created. During their sojourn in the wilderness, God instituted a day of atonement for the Israelites whereby two lambs or goats were brought to the high priest for a sin offering. One of these was killed as a sin offering. The other was called the scapegoat. On the head of the scapegoat, the high priest confessed all the sins of the people. After that, it was led away into the wilderness 
where it would probably wander and die. This exercise was intended to emphasize the importance of getting rid of sin each year in order to please God. In Numbers chapter 21, we learn that the Israelites grew very impatient and spoke against God and against Moses. They said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There's no bread, there's no water, and we detest this miserable food. Numbers 21 verse 5. So the Lord sent venomous snakes among them, and they bit the people, and many died. This made the people repent of their sin. They asked Moses to pray for them to be saved. Moses was told to make a snake, to put it on a pole, so that everyone could see it. Anyone who was bitten could then look at the snake and live. We notice that Jesus used this as a lesson, applying to his own example of being lifted up on the cross and providing salvation to all who believe. John 3, 14 and 15. In Numbers 24, we find the various oracles spoken by Balaam, the prophet of God in the time of Moses. In his fourth oracle, Balaam says, a star will come out of Jacob, a scepter will rise out of Israel. This prophecy seems to agree with the words of Jacob when he predicted that a scepter would not depart from Judah and a ruler would come and have control over the nations. And that's a clear reference to Jesus becoming the King of Kings on his return from the heavens, as explained in Revelation 1 verse 7. In Deuteronomy 18, Moses speaks to the people about a prophet whom the Lord God shall raise up, like Moses himself, and the people are urged to listen to him because God will put words in his mouth for their instruction and benefit. Deuteronomy 18, 18. In Acts chapter 3, we find the Apostle Peter referring to this and explaining that the prophet intended by Moses was none other than Jesus who had been crucified but had risen again by the mighty power of God. Peter added the fact that he must remain in heaven until the time came for God to restore everything as he promised long ago. Acts 3, 18 to 22. The book of Ruth tells us about a Bethlehem family, Elimelech and Naomi, and their two sons, who went to Moab to avoid a famine. Both boys married Moabite girls. Elimelech and both boys eventually died. Naomi decided to return to Bethlehem, and Ruth showed her love by going back with her. In fact, she also changed her allegiance to her Moabite God, to that of the true God of Israel. Ruth began working in the fields belonging to Boaz, the son of Rahab of Jericho. Ruth fell in love and they married in Bethlehem. Ruth's son was Obed, and Obed's son was Jesse, and Jesse's son was David who became king of Israel, Ruth 4.17. We notice that David wrote most of the Psalms, 
And there are many psalms which speak of a coming Messiah and King. For example, Psalm 2 tells us about the Anointed One. Psalm 16 is a reference to Christ as the Holy One who gains victory over death. Psalm 16 and 10. Psalm 22. In that, that psalm we have the actual words of Christ who died on the cross. Psalm 22, 1. Verses 7 and 8 of the same chapter give us the exact words of Christ uttered moments before his death. Verse 16 tells us how Christ was nailed to his cross. Verse 18 talks about the soldiers who divided Christ's garments. And these verses were written 1,000 years before the event happened. In Psalm 41, we have another reference to Christ's crucifixion, his betrayal by one of his disciples. Psalm 41, verse 9. In Psalm 45, Christ is referred to as God, which means Mighty One, sitting on an everlasting throne. Psalm 45, 6 and 7. Verse 7 mentions the word God twice, indicating the difference between the, the Almighty God, that is the Father of Christ, and his beloved Son, who is also called God, a Mighty One. Psalm 69 tells us what they offered to Christ while he was hanging on his cross. Psalm 69, 21. Psalm 72 tells us the length of Christ's reign. Psalm 72, 5 and 8. The 78th Psalm talks about Christ speaking to the people in parables. Psalm 78, 1 and 2. Psalm 110 tells us that Christ will sit on God's and right, God's right hand, that the Messiah would be a king and a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Psalm 118 indicates that Christ would be the stone which was rejected by the builders and has become the head of the corner, that is, a new building which is built upon Christ, the foundation stone. Psalm 118, verse 22. The builders would be the Jews who rejected our Lord, despite all the miracles that he performed before their eyes. In Isaiah chapter 2, there are several promises made by the Lord in regard to the future millennial age. It tells us about the mountain of the Lord being supreme above the other mountains. In prophetic language, a mountain refers to a kingdom. Isaiah 2 verse 3. Zion was the holy hill in Jerusalem. The nations of the world will come and worship the Lord after they've beaten their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks because there will no longer be any more wars. Isaiah 2 verse 4 And the Lord has chosen Jerusalem as his royal city and the people will come to Jerusalem to learn how to live according to God's will. In Isaiah chapter 7, we read that a virgin will conceive and bear a son. shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Matthew quotes this verse 
and refers it to Mary, the mother of Christ, and Jesus, her son. Matthew 1.23 In Isaiah 9, more details are given about this special child. When he's grown up, he will reign on David's throne and bring justice and righteousness to the world. He will be called the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. God promised David that his kingdom would last forever, 2 Samuel 7, verse 16. Jesus was of the same tribe and bloodline as David, and therefore became the fulfilment of that promise. In Isaiah 11, we read of a shoot coming up from the stump of Jesse, and from his roots a branch will bear fruit. Isaiah 11, verse 1. Jesse was David's father, so this refers to a descendant of Jesse, an obvious reference to Christ, who will reign with justice and righteousness in the next age. Isaiah 11, 3 and 4. Isaiah goes on to describe the situation in that future time. The wolf will lay down with the lamb. The lion will eat straw like the ox. The young child will put his hand in the viper's nest and the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Isaiah 11, 7 to 9. The 53rd chapter of Isaiah describes the type of suffering that Jesus had to endure. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. He was despised and we esteemed him not. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Isaiah 53, 3-11 Jeremiah, in his writings, describes the forthcoming of one who comes from the line of David, who is a righteous branch and a king who will reign wisely, doing what is just and right. And that's clearly a reference to Christ, announcing some 600 years before his birth. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6. In Daniel chapter 2, we find that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and wanted his wise men to interpret that dream, but they were not able to. When Daniel found out, he prayed to the Lord and the Lord answered his prayer by means of a vision in the night. The dream was about a large statue of a man, his head made of pure gold, his chest and arms were made of silver, his belly and thighs were made of bronze and his feet part iron and part clay. Daniel explained to the king that the image represented four kingdoms, four world empires, 
Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Daniel went on to tell the king that a rock was cut out, not by human hands, which struck the statue on its feet, breaking up the image into pieces, which became like chaff on the threshing floor. Then the wind blew all the pieces away without leaving a trace. The rock which struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. In the 600 years from Daniel to Christ, there were four world empires, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And Jesus was born during the Roman Empire, which was part iron and part clay in the dream. In Daniel chapter 9, we find Daniel asking the Lord to tell him when his father would return to Israel. After the 70 years of captivity in Babylon, so God sent the angel Gabriel to Daniel to reveal the answer to his request. Gabriel told Daniel that it would be 483 years between the decree to rebuild Jerusalem and the coming of the Anointed One. This decree was issued by the Persian king in 457 BC adding 483 years to 457 BC brings us to 26 AD, which was the very year that Jesus was baptised and began his public ministry. Also, the Anointed One was to be cut off in the midst of the week, meaning three and a half years Later, the anointed one would, would die to purge away sin and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Daniel 9.24 Gabriel's prophecy goes on to tell Daniel that the end will come like a flood whereby the people of the coming ruler will destroy the city of Jerusalem and will set up an abomination which causes desolation until the decreed end is finally poured out. <coughs> Daniel 9, 26, 27. The prophecy appears to refer to the Roman army which surrounded and <coughs> destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD when many thousands lost their lives and Christians were scattered throughout the surrounding country. The prophet John announced that God was going to pour out his spirit on the people in the latter days, Joel 2, 28, 29. On the day of Pentecost, the apostle Peter said that this prophecy in Joel was being fulfilled before the eyes of the people in Jerusalem. Acts 2, 16 to 18. The prophecy goes on to tell us about the sun being dark and the moon turned to blood before the Lord actually comes. However, this part of the prophecy is apparently still future. We've been looking at the promises God has made in order to rescue mankind from the grave. Promises beginning in the Garden of Eden, continuing on through the lives of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, the wilderness experiences, Balaam, the Psalms of David, the writings of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel and the prophet Joel all pointing forward to the Lamb of God who gave his life to take away the sins of the world. The Old Testament depicts Jesus as the seed of the woman, the star of Bethlehem, the king and priest, 
the branch, the prince, the anointed one, the mighty God, and the everlasting father of mankind. So how favoured we are to recognise all these promises. How thankful are we to be given the opportunity to share in the future blessings which are yet to come to a world that awaits redemption from sin and death. Praise be to our God, the God of love. Amen.